Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Today's webinar is incorporating traditional foods and child nutrition program menus. I'm Bob Gorman, I'm the Farm to School Regional Lead in the Mountain Plains there, uh, region, stationed here in uh, sunny Denver, Colorado. I got two guests with me today, Jenny Montague, she's a nutritionist with uh, USDA. How you doing today, Jenny? Hey there, Bob. And I'm also joined by Joan Dawson, who's the state director in Adla uh, excuse me, for the Alaska Department of Education. How are you doing today, Joe? Hi there. Doing great. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks for joining us. Real quick, I just got a one quick housekeeping slide. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to type it in. It's at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. You should see a little chat box. We are recording this webinar. It should be posted in our, on our website within a week or two. Um, a PDF of the slides will be emailed to you after the webinar today. And then um, after the webinar, if you would, please fill out the evaluation form. And that'll come up as soon as you X out of today's webinar. A little pop-up box will pop up. And I think it's just like three or four questions. And again, before I turn it over to Jen, I do have a couple slides I would like to review. One of them are some of the, we're calling them the new policy memos, but they've been out for a year or two now. And um, I got three of them to review. And I sent them to you yesterday with the reminder email about the uh, webinar. So um, please feel, hopefully you had a chance to review them. If not, I will send them back out with the thank you email um, after today's webinar. So if you didn't get a chance to read them, I'll send them to you again and you'll be able to check them out. But the first one I just briefly want to talk about is the Child Nutrition Programs and Traditional Foods Policy Memo. And this basically says that traditional foods are allowed to be served in child nutrition programs, okay, but then also that the USDA um, encourages it, all right? So, you know, we, we do want to see as many traditional foods being served as possible. Um, and the second one I would like to briefly review is about service of traditional foods in public facilities, which also includes schools. And that basically the whole gist of that is that Schools may um, accept and serve donated, unprocessed traditional foods. So again, that's for donated traditional foods, but they have to be unprocessed. And then the last one is, is the meat one, procuring local meat. And that specifically says um, that livestock must be slaughtered at a USDA um, or state inspected facility to be served in child nutrition programs. And it also um, states, it talks a little bit about shell eggs and that they do not need to be pasteurized. Um, but nevertheless, please take a look at these policy memos. If you have any questions about them, please feel free to reach out to your farm to school regional lead if you have any questions. All right, so generally when we're talking farm to school, um, people often just think of fruits and vegetables. Um, and, you know, those are great as well, but they do, farm to school does extend into the proteins and then, of course, milk. But farm to school also goes into um, traditional foods. And as these policy memos were stating, you know, this includes products like bison, blue corn, uh, local fish like salmon and trout, all right? So we're not just talking um, local carrots or apples and stuff like that. Um, it does expand over the whole tray that, um, you know, the kids are served. And it is um, buffalo, you know, like I said, it could be bison or anything like that. Um, you know, so there's a lot of great products that you could serve. Here is a great example of a traditional um, plate. And this was served in uh, Georgia, and this has local chicken, and that's an egg corn squash, 
and then like a, a this is a corn and uh, bean soup, and um, it looks a lot better than the lunch I had today, and I'm sure it is a lot more delicious than what I had. But again, this this tray it's traditional, um, it's beautiful, and it, it, it's a great tray, and I'm sure the kids enjoyed it. So that's just like a little example of what's being done out there. And now I, I do want to turn it over to our first guest speaker, Jenny Montague, and she's uh, the nutritionalist at Food and Nutrition in, at the USDA National Office in D.C. Um, go ahead and take it away, Jen. There, Bob. Well, first of all, I'd like to tell you all that I had so much fun doing research for this webinar. Um, I gathered information by interviewing people working in school districts and tribal communities in the regions now known as Montana, Hawaii, Alaska, New Mexico, and North Carolina. And while I found their approaches to integrating traditional foods to be unique and varied, um, the goal is the same, to learn about people, place, and tradition through food. And just as we leave it up to schools to define what local means, we also leave it up to them to define what using traditional foods means. So for some, I learned that that means um, they're trying to procure foods from some of the 48,000 American Indian, Alaska Native, or Hawaiian um, Pacific Island farms in operation in the U.S. And for others, that means using domesticated produce in conjunction with native recipes or um, identifying foods uh, using native language. So I'd like to go over a few of the stories from these amazing districts that I interviewed, and then we'll get into some details um, about um, you know, the specifics of substituting foods into, as meal components in the um, child nutrition programs, which can be done in you know, a number of programs. Um, and we're, we're focusing on mostly um, the National School Lunch Program today. So um, many of the staples in, we use in the U.S. and throughout the world originally came from Native American cultures and land. Um, however, many of the foods have been domesticated and no longer contain the rich nutrient value that they once did. So many communities and schools are working to procure or grow versions of these foods that are the same or similar to those that their ancestors used. This is a photo of students doing a taste test of a traditional bean bread recipe um, at Cherokee Central Schools that Jeanette Broda sent me um, in Cherokee, North Carolina. And she told me that many of the staff at the kitchen and the, at the school um, know how to cook these traditional recipes, but it's a real challenge to um, cook them at the institutional level, so scaling them up and cooking them for the 1,200 students that, um, that this school serves. Uh, but they did a fantastic job here. You can see that the recipe was a great success. Um, they did change it to be healthier. Um, normally it's served with a side of grease and they left that out, but um, everyone still loved the recipe. Um, they also have done other taste tests. Um, last year of local trout cake, which everyone loved, and they're planning to um, do different preparations of cabbage, um, uh, chestnut bread, um, and they're hoping to use some wild game as well. Another thing that uh, Cherokee Central Schools is doing, um, and many schools in tribal communities, they're choosing to grow traditional vegetables. Um, we all know that students who participate in growing vegetables are more likely to try them. Um, and a lot of times these um, heirloom vegetables can be hard to find to procure. So um, this provides the vegetables themselves and the experiential learning. Um, as I mentioned, this school serves 1,200 students pre-K through 12, and this school um, is also um, incorporating traditional foods. Um, has, it's always been an, an intention for this school district. And uh, the school was built to include many features that help incorporate traditional art and culture, like basket weaving designs and wood used from the land here. They also have a greenhouse and garden beds. 
and um, they're working to get GAP certified so that they can use more of the produce that they're growing um, in school lunch. Another special way that Cherokee Central Schools is using their culture in their food program is by using their traditional language for certain foods on their menu and um, on the signs in their school garden, which you saw on the previous slide. Um, in February this year, they highlighted the apple, which I will mispronounce, but shivangta, um, something like that. It, it's a tough, tough to pronounce if you're not um, used to using this language, but um, this, they also locally grow apples in addition to lettuce and cabbage, which are highlighted on this menu. And then on the right, you'll see children's illustrations of fruits and vegetables with the Cherokee names for those products. Um, as Bob mentioned, traditional foods can count towards the required components of meal required um, meal requirements here. Um, you know, the five meal requirements, fruit, vegetable, milk, grains, and meat or meat alternates. Um, and, you know, we'll go through a couple of the, the, the different requirements, um, meat or meat alternates, including beans and rare meats, um, and fruits, vegetables, including um, many from the different vegetable subgroups, such as dark green, red orange, legume, starchy, and other. Grains, using traditional grains generally credit um, as whole grains, which is a great benefit, of course. Um, and sometimes the same ingredients can credit in different components depending on how they're processed or used in the meal. Example, beans or corn. Um, corn can be processed into flour or used as corn kernels. Um, and we'll just remind everybody, students are required to take at least three components of a meal, including at least half a cup of fruits or vegetables for the National School Lunch Program. Um, so we're talking about beans. Um, here we have our um, the white and brown temporary beans used to serve schools in the, um, of the Tohono O'odham Nation, which can be substituted as a, a meat or meat alternate. Um, beans can also meet the legume requirement of vegetables. And this particular recipe here was so popular that the food service management company, Sodexo, um, made it a regular feature on the menu. They tried it once and um, it went over so well that it's now featured on a monthly basis, which is fantastic. Um, protein substitutions. Um, here we have bison or meat, or bison or venison, um, which can be substituted in child nutrition program standardized recipes like burgers or chili, um, anything that calls for meat. Um, or they can be used in traditional recipes. Um, one of the schools we talked to um, makes the recipe venison acorn stew. And the yield for venison or bison are similar to beef. Um, and you can find out that information um, using the food buying guide. Not all of the traditional foods, of course, are included in the food buying guide, but you can um, deduct, you know, find a food that's most similar to the one that you're using to determine um, what the yield is and what the crediting is. And uh, I can get into that a little more, answer questions. We also have a phone number, I mean, an email that I'll leave later if people have specific questions about that. Um, many schools um, use fish, which is a super healthy protein option. Um, I think they'll talk about that a little more um, when our speaker from Alaska um, comes on. But salmon, cod, trout, and other fish um, are important traditional foods and um, can be used in kid-friendly recipes. Um, and one of the recipes that we have here is from the First Lady's um, recipe contest, student recipe contest, the roasted fish crispy slaw. So um, fish can be, you know, used in a traditional way or included in um, many of these recipes. Um, grain substitutions, um, of course, intact grains or flours, um, such as amaranth, barley, quinoa, are healthy substitutes for any other grain in a 
grain salad or a baked good. Um, wild rice can be substituted for other rice options and can be served sprouted, puffed, or as a flour. Um, blue cornmeal can be served in the traditional mush or used in other recipes that call for cornmeal. Um, and I've found in many cases um, recipes that call for a pasta can also, you could substitute a grain in those cases um, and make the recipe healthier in the process. Um, fruits are of course popular with kids and some of the native fruits including blueberries, huckleberries, concord grapes, and pineapple. Um, there are others, um, especially in the tropical islands, um, but they can be served fresh or as part of a recipe. Um, traditional fruits can be combined with other fruits and vegetables in smoothies. That's of course a popular and um, trendy preparation method these days. Um, or you can buy value-added products that incorporate these, these products. Um, and because some of these fruits are more expensive, some schools have found that the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program is a good way to, because the goal of the program is to expose um, students to fruits, new fruits and vegetables, and to provide nutrition education. So it gives you an outlet to, um, to talk about some of the, the cultural significance of these products. Um, vegetable substitutions, um, as we talked about, corn can be both a vegetable or a grain. So native whole blue or white corn um, credits towards the starchy vegetable subgroup. Um, Navajo, Navajo corn and squash soup has been popular at Star Schools, who spoke on our previous webinar. Um, and they can be substituted in kid-tested USDA recipes such as Mexicali corn or corn and green bean casserole. Um, also indigenous vi varieties of other um, vegetables such as um, pumpkin, red peppers, they credit towards the red-orange subgroup. Um, and then as we mentioned, the beans, um, legume, and of course potatoes into the starchy subgroup. Um, another school that I spoke to in Molokai uh, is um, working with Food Corps service members and uh, they have been using taro root to prepare the traditional poi, which is a staple. Uh, they're using poi in the traditional, or they're using taro in the traditional preparation and then also uh, it can be prepared in other ways or substituted for sweet potato or parsnip. And it actually already is in the food buying guide and credits as a starchy vegetable. So some of the fruits and vegetables that you will find um, don't necessarily credit because they are not used in a quantity that, um, that allows them to, such as acorns, which um, don't have enough protein to qualify as a meat or meat alternate, but they do impart flavor and, of course, um, contribute to the cultural significance of these food. And a little goes a long way, so even if they are um, expensive, um, they, they do a lot for, um, for these things. Other examples are ramps in North Carolina, syrup from birch trees in Alaska, and miner's lettuce and juniper berries. And as Bob mentioned, the USDA encourages schools and child care programs to incorporate traditional foods into their child nutrition programs because they bring cultural significance and improved nutrition to the children in their communities. Um, for more information, you can contact your state agency representatives and your regional farm to school leads for questions about procurement, or you can email the nutritionists at the Nutrition and Technical Assistance Branch of Child Nutrition Programs for questions about the food buying guide and crediting of traditional foods. So we're here to help. Thank you so much, Jenny. I think it's great how you know food service management companies, not just Sodexo, but a variety of them, including self-op operations, are serving these traditional foods. It's really great. So before I turn it over to, to Joe, um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to go ahead and type them in the, the chat box, and we'll try to get to them at the end. And uh, go ahead, Joe. If Hi, thank you so much. 
Um, so today I'm going to um, discuss a little bit how um, in Alaska we've um, been able to really support the use of uh, traditional foods um, in the array of child nutrition programs we have in our state. Um, this here. Um, so this is a, a poster that we worked with um, with the Farm to School Coordinator. Um, this is one of our first collaborative uh, projects in uh, really trying to um, help students really see in Alaska where their food's coming from. Um, a lot of our food does come from the lower 48, and it's good to know that we, we actually are growing food or harvesting food, catching food here in Alaska. Because of the high interest um, by so many of our child nutrition program um, operators, whether it's schools, child care programs, Head Start, or summer food um, agencies, um, there are a lot of opportunities in our state for um, partnerships in supporting traditional foods. Uh, we definitely see its importance um, in the meal programs throughout our state. Um, on this slide here is a poster series, um, and there's an accompanying toolkit. Um, and this project was headed up by the University of Alaska. We were just one of many partner agencies to collaborate um, in the development of this toolkit. Um, besides um, our agency, there were other governmental um, agencies involved in this, as well as um, tribal um, entities, nonprofit agencies, uh, even food service management companies, um, all helping to, um, to develop this um, toolkit, which um, provides a lot of information on the foods that can be donated um, in Alaska, the foods that cannot, uh, preparation, storage, and processing. And so this has been, I think this was just released I'm going to say about six months or so ago, and uh, distributed widely um, across our state. <clears throat> Despite um, all of our efforts, there still exists a misperception that our programs cannot accept traditional foods. Um, when we hear that, um, I really like to refer back to the definition provided by the Farm Bill. Um, you know, which really lists those, those items that are supported um, as traditional foods and, and ask, you know, specifically what foods uh, can we not accept because so many are really covered by the, the Farm Bill. Um, as well, when we receive um, questions from program operators um, on specific traditional foods um, that might not be in the, the food buying guide, such as like what Jenny was saying, um, the nutritionist um, that we have, that we work with at our USDA regional office has always been really great at working with us um, so that we can uh, determine the credibility of traditional foods um, and be able to provide that to program operators. Um, overcoming the perception that traditional foods are not allowable um, or not creditable has been difficult and we just continue to outreach on it so that um, programs really um, understand what foods they can accept and, and how to how to integrate them into their program operations. Um, so we are lucky in Alaska that we have a very close relationship uh, with our State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, that's who does um, our Alaska Food Code. They do the, the food permits. Um, and we've been able to provide a lot of guidance and resources to our nutrition programs in Alaska um, based on the Alaska Food Code. Um, and as you can see from this slide, I mean, there's an, a lot of food, um, uh, traditional foods that are allowed to be donated to um, nutrition programs. Uh, we have the wild game meat, seafood, and plants. Um, we provide them additional information um, on what they should check for as they're receiving their food, um, how to um, how to process it, how to store it, um, and, and provide that other information. Um, but we are um, very, very lucky to have that, that relationship with um, the other state agency on the inspections. Um, as well, our Alaska Food Code um, does prohibit um, certain foods. This information is also in that, that poster series. Um, but there are certain foods that, um, by regulation, um, are not allowed to be served that are um, can be determined as, as traditional. Our State Department of Environmental, Mental, sorry, Environmental Conservation, though, um, is really um, willing to work with schools or Head Start agencies on a variance process. So if there is a situation where a school wanted to serve seal oil, um, 
our environmental conservation is willing to work with them on a variance to see what that would look like, how they would make sure that um, risks could be mitigated. And I think that's really important um, that they can kind of go through that process um, if it's something that is important to them um, and be able to document, um, you know, what, what controls they have in place um, to make sure that um, the food being served is safe. Um, one of the other barriers we ran into was actually in the Farm Bill, um, which stated that the donation to and serving of traditional foods through for food service po uh, programs at public facilities and nonprofit facilities, including facilities operated by Indian tribes and facilitated by tribal organizations that serve um, primarily serve Indians. So in Alaska, only half of our districts are primarily Alaska Native or American Indian. So that language in the Farm Bill did somewhat prevent some of our school districts from being able to uh, receive those donations. Um, the reality is that supply is our biggest issue when it comes to traditional foods in schools. Um, receiving enough of any uh, one traditional food to be able to serve uh, a meal to all students. We do see um, much more use of non-commercial um, traditional foods in our smaller programs, such as um, a Head Start agency or a child care program where the, the serving sizes aren't as large, the population isn't quite as big. It's very interesting to note that um, the reality of barriers is, is so much different than the perception of barriers. Um, our farm school coordinator in Alaska, Johanna Heron, uh, conducted a study last year to determine what the, what the real barriers are to serving local and traditional foods and school meals. We really just couldn't figure out um, why everyone thought they couldn't do it. <laughs> we, we kept outreaching, and yet that perception was still out there. Um, and so looking at this slide, you can see that folks in school nutrition really acknowledge that the supply is their top issue. Uh, preference is there. There are some regulations they have to work through, um, and then cost and equipment. But for folks not in school nutrition, they really believe that, um, that the regulatory issues were the top barrier preventing um, traditional foods in school. And I thought that was really interesting to note. Um, you know, those are the people who say, well, we need to do this. We need to allow it. And we come back to, but we do allow it. How can we help you? Um, and we really want to keep supporting that. Um, further, the districts who are um, actively serving traditional foods um, in their menu indicated, again, that supply was their biggest hurdle. Uh, the districts who are not providing traditional foods, again, stated that the um, state and federal regulations were their barrier. So in a lot of ways, those schools not serving the traditional foods are allowing their perception of the barrier become a barrier. Um, so they're not really getting past that. Um, so knowing that supply is the biggest issue um, for a lot of our schools, uh, commercial resources um, have been a, a way to ensure that traditional foods um, have been able to provide for school meals. One of our best examples of out-of-the-box thinking started in about 2009 by Patty Luckhurst in um, Dillingham, Alaska. Uh, Dillingham is a very small community of about uh, 2,000 residents. Um, it's off the road system like most of our communities in Alaska. Uh, several hundred miles away from our largest city. And so most of their resources are brought in by barge or plane. Um, the food service director there, Patty Luckhurst, had, um, had this brainchild of an idea to work with um, the local uh, fish processing plant and um, local fishermen, commercial fishermen, for donations. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the cannery is donating the labor um, of gutting, filleting, and uh, vacuum sealing, flash freezing the fish from the district. They established a uh, designated donation day during the sockeye season. Um, sockeye is a kind of salmon for anyone who doesn't know. So this program began, uh, like I said, in 2007 and still continues. Um, these <clears throat> designated donation days bring in about 12,000 pounds of donated salmon um, that are received and processed into flash frozen fillets. Um, <clears throat> this district serves fish um, once a week, and families are invited to have lunch with their children and partake in the meal. It's a pretty awesome site because 
the whole community has participated um, in this process, and they're very proud to come um, and share the meal with their, um, with their children or grandchildren. There's a lot of community pride um, as a result of this um, by those families contributing in such a meaningful way. So much salmon is received um, annually through this, um, this program that um, they, this district actually also shares with another school district, Southwest Region School District, um, their area Head Start agencies, and a senior center. While this is a, um, our only large-scale commercial donation program, um, actually many of our Alaska school districts have close partnerships with their local fish processing um, plants uh, to provide um, good fish to school programs. So um, four years ago in Alaska, um, our state provided non-competitive grant funding through the Department of Commerce to support <clears throat> school district purchase of local foods. This was very popular funding with our districts, um, but the funding was determined annually, so it was very difficult for um, schools or growers or producers to plan in advance on the funds. The purchases were made from an array of Alaska grown or harvested products, but because of that short planning season, each year about one third of the funding was lapsed. The funding only lasted for um, three years. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but one of the impacts of this program was an ability to assess what schools would purchase locally um, you know, with, with the, those monies. Um, seafood was the largest expenditure of the grant funds, and because it's easy to get year-round, there was a strong market for it in schools. What we were finding is that um, the districts had few standardized recipes for seafood that met the USDA nutritional requirements. We had a lot of school nutrition staff in our state looking for direction on how to prepare these local foods, um, particularly the raw seafood. To meet the need for the recipes um, using Alaska grown and harvested products that are less common in the lower 48, uh, such as salmon, reindeer, and caribou, uh, we developed a recipe, well, a cookbook for schools, childcare centers, and uh, residential childcare institutions uh, to prepare their menu items from scratch using locally grown products um, in those recipes. Through a grant from um, USDA Team Nutrition, um, our department uh, worked in collaboration with the University of Alaska Fairbanks Cooperative Extension Service and the Farm to School program um, on that cookbook called Make It um, Local Recipes for Alaska Children. This was a pretty exciting process um, to go through. Um, utilizing the Cooperative Extension Test Kitchen um, as well as um, on-site meal service at a local area school we're able to develop or modify existing recipes using local foods. We um, created standardized recipes that could be used at school or with portion reductions at our child and adult care food programs. The recipes were then tried, um, tried out with school children for taste testing. One of the first things that stood out after the first round was that taste testing uh, with children reflected a disinclination towards some of the seafood product, uh, products. Um, rather than taking those recipes out of the project, we instead looked at the demographics of the school we were testing at, which was a um, fairly large school in an urban center. We added another site with um, youth from rural Alaska whose diets uh, regularly included traditional foods. This was a very successful move for us. And many of the recipes that were at risk of removal from the project um, due to uh, poor acceptance were modified and retested on the second group of children, and many were found to be very successful. After the release of the cookbook, um, there came an unintentional but rather strong media blitz um, when we um, were provided these across the state. We saw a lot of interest in um, these cookbooks, um, even to uh, programs outside of the, the child nutrition programs. Um, so that was really heartening to see how many people across our state were, were very interested in, um, in this project. Um, all across Alaska, we, see, we continue to see seafood and other traditional scratch cooked foods um, across um, in our state, uh, sorry, school menus. 
um, we were worried that this might just be short-lived, but it's really been able to carry on. Um, and the acceptance has been uh, phenomenal with, with many of the districts. And I think we have one last here. Um, and again, this is Dillingham, who um, has seafood on their recipe at least every Friday. And as you can see from this menu, um, they have it on um, halibut as well on their menu. So they're serving very healthy local food um, through their, their child nutrition program. Another part of our, um, our cookbook project was just providing nutritional specifications for traditional foods that they might not normally find in the food buying guide. Beach asparagus is one that um, we had actually worked with our uh, USDA nutritionist uh, quite, quite a few years ago on uh, the nutrition facts because it is um, a very, very popular traditional food. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Joe. Hey, quick question. Where, can we get our hands on this cookbook? Where is it? Um, absolutely you can. Um, we are um, in the process of a couple modifications. I think we just, we're in the process of reposting it on our website. Um, so it's, you can download it, um, which I think my information was on the, on the um, invitation to the webinar, um, okay. or you can contact us and we can send um, people a printed copy. Great, thank you so much. And I'm sorry today, we've sort of, we've run way over, um, but I would still like to thank our presenters today. They did an awesome job. So if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in, but I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. So we're not gonna get to the questions today, but um, if you did ask a question, we will respond back to you via email. Probably it'll take us a few days, but we will get back to you. So I, I do apologize for us running over. But I also want to remind you of our next webinar, which is May 4th at 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And um, again, thank you for attending, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone.